We're going to start in Isaiah chapter 61. I've preached this message. This will now be the third time I've preached this message, not here at this campus, but the third time I've preached this message. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I believe this is a prophetic message to the church right now. And I believe this is a message that God is wanting to stir up in the body of Christ. If I'm honest, as I think about all the things that are happening in our nation, that have been happening in our nation for, for years, is I think sometimes in the church so we fall victim to a belief system, an ideology that if we just stay safe here, it won't affect us. If we just deal with the issues of culture, then my kids will be safe, that my family will be safe, that everything will be okay. And I'd like to propose as I preach this message that you would have ears to hear because my desire is to provoke you to do the will of God in our generation. There's only one answer and one solution to chaos in our world and it's the power of the gospel. Isaiah chapter 61, starting one, says the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the vengeance of our God. I came to tell you this morning that when His Spirit is upon you, His kingdom will move through you. This is the year of reformation. 2024 is the year of reformation. I believe everything God does each year is not only prophetic, but God speaks about what we are to live in. It's a John 3.30 year. It's the year where we decrease and He increases. It's the year where God's making crooked ways made straight. Like you can't look at the news. You can't follow anybody on social media and not see that God is making every crooked path straight. It's the year where God is making wrong things right. And it's the year where God is shaking everything that can be shaken. Hebrews chapter 12 though says that we're part of an unshakable kingdom, meaning that we serve a God that cannot be shaken by the elements of this world. He's not surprised, he's not shocked, he's not up in heaven saying, wow, what's happening down on the earth? What's happening in the United States? He's in fact in heaven and he's actually laughing at his enemies who are trying to do their best to try to stop God's kingdom from advancing. See, reformation will come wherever you and I bring the kingdom of God. Isaiah 61 verse one said, where the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news. See, the Lord did anoint you to come to a church service. I wish I had a few people had an amen this morning. The Lord did anoint you to sing great songs. The Lord didn't anoint you even to just have a gift that honors Him. The Lord has anointed you and I to preach or proclaim the good news. We will not see revival and reformation apart from the gospel of Jesus. So what is the good news? It's the gospel. What is the gospel, you might ask? It's the good news about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the good news of salvation found through Jesus. It's more than just salvation though of your spirit and one day going to heaven. It's the salvation of your soul here on the earth, your mind, will, and emotions. But it's also the salvation of your body, the wholeness of God in the wholeness of man. See, when Jesus began to start preaching, he began to preach this message, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. This turn the kingdom of God or the kingdom of uh, of heaven is seen in, uh, uh, in just the Gospels, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 84 times alone. When Jesus preached this kingdom, he preached this gospel of the kingdom, he preached this good news of the kingdom. And you might ask, well, what is the kingdom? The kingdom is simply this. It's the dominion or the rule and the reign of the king. Wherever Jesus is king, that's where his kingdom rules. It's where he reigns and rules over the earth. It's the absolute sovereign authority over all the earth. In fact, the Bible says in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. 
And the good news or the gospel was the announcement of the king and his kingdom that would come. In today's culture, when we think about the gospel, though, we think about this ideology or this perspective of Jesus simply rescuing me from my sins and me having a better life. Yet, if you read the New Testament and go back to the Old Testament, there was announcement and proclamation all throughout the Old Testament of this gospel of the kingdom coming. Every time you see, you see King David, you see King Solomon, you see all these kings and there was wars. There was these constant fighting between two kingdoms and one kingdom would rule the other kingdom. And so there's this proclamation and this prophecy that pretty soon there's going to become a Messiah and he's going to establish a kingdom on the earth that would rule and reign over every other kingdom. We see in the book of Daniel prophesied that this kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, that his kingdom shall never be destroyed, that his dominion and his might shall have no end. And yet there's a moment of 400 years of silence in the Bible where there's no prophetic voice and no announcement of this king. And it created this expectation in the culture and the society, looking, wondering, waiting, when is this king going to come and what kind of kingdom will he establish? And after this comes, all of a sudden John the Baptist shows up and he begins to proclaim, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What we're saying is everybody get ready because there's a king that's going to come. And when his kingdom comes, every other kingdom will be demolished and destroyed and his kingdom will rule on the earth forever and ever. We see in Luke chapter four, verse 17 through 22, after Jesus comes on the scene, he's baptized in the water, the heavens are open, the Holy Spirit descends upon him. And then he's led after the 40 days of testing, he goes into the synagogue and he picks up the prophet of the, uh, the prophet Isaiah, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolls it and he finds this place in scripture. Isaiah 61, and he reads that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolls it back up. He hands it to the attendant. And then he looks at everyone who's sitting there in amazement. And he says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. What he was saying this, today my kingdom starts. Today my kingdom's come upon the earth. It's not going to come one day. It's not in the sweet by and by, but at this very exact moment, my kingdom will come upon the earth. And everything from that moment has changed. Everything in society changed and transformed. See, he didn't come just to simply be a person who rescued people from their sins. But Jesus came to deliver humanity from the darkness that plagued the earth. Jesus went around and he began to declare and demonstrate the kingdom by everything he did, by healing the sick, casting out demons, raising the dead, and many other signs and wonders. Jesus did not simply just declare the kingdom. He demonstrated it. And I wanna say this. I think one of the greatest indictments on the charismatic church the church that believes in the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit. That's mercy culture. That we are more fixed on simply declaring the truth than actually demonstrating the truth. And you can't have one without the other. You can't declare Jesus being the king who would heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, and cast out demons and not do it because it then becomes a false message that we proclaim. We tell people about all these amazing things that Jesus can do. And then all of a sudden we're like, uh, well, I guess he's just not doing it today because we're not demonstrating the reality of what Jesus had promised. See, Jesus says this to the writer in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20. The kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. You know, I'm constantly asking myself, where is the power of God working in and through my life? Forget about me looking at somebody else and saying, well, why isn't the power of God moving in the church? Why isn't the power of God moving through that pastor or that leader? I'm looking at my own life 
And I'm saying, why is the power of God, the demonstration of the dunamis, the fullness of heaven that He's poured out by the Holy Spirit that Jesus died on the cross to give you and I, why is it not moving through my life? And this is what I'd like to propose. It's because we're okay without it. Because we feel spiritual. And we act spiritual because we do things that make us feel or sense the presence, but we don't do things that proclaim and demonstrate His power. If all we do is come to church and feel His presence, but don't bring His power to a person who's crippled, blind, sick, bound in sin, crushed by the disease of pornography and immorality in our culture, then what is this gospel really about? Is it really that good news? If it's good news, then we must proclaim it and demonstrate it everywhere we went. See, Jesus not only declared it, he demonstrated. Jesus proved the will of God by demonstrating the kingdom of God. We're like, well, this is God's will for your life. But are we demonstrating it by proclaiming and both demonstrating? Jesus says this in the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. It says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, when his kingdom comes, his will is done. It's that simple. When his kingdom comes... His will is done. There's so many people in culture wrestling with what is the will of God. Well, is this the will of God? Is that the will of God? And I'm gonna give you a simple answer. What is the will of God? Heaven on earth. If it doesn't have a heaven involved in it, it's not the will of God. If heaven is not showing up in that circumstance, that situation, that area of culture, that area in your family, that area in your child, then heaven still has a place it wants to possess and it wants to rule and reign. See, His kingdom is not of this world. And so we can't approach things according to our knowledge or perspective. The desire and the will of Jesus is that His kingdom would come, that the dominion and the might of the king would rule on earth as it is in heaven. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of people missing out on God's purpose and God's plan because they misinterpret and misunderstand the will of God. Many, even maybe you in this room, have confused the difference between the will of God and what God will work together for the good. There's a completely major difference. I've heard people say this after tragedy or loss or something very difficult at heart. Well, that must just been the will of God. And what we've done is we've relegated the will of God of whatever happens, God's just going to have to do something with it. And there's a major difference between what is the will of God, what God has purposed and planned and desired, what's in his heart and his mind, and what God will take and work together for his good. God can take anything that's evil, corrupt, perverse, and he can make something together out of it. See, all he needs is Jesus plus nothing equals everything. What he's looking for is some people saying, God, I'm going to decrease so you can increase in my life. Let's not get it confused. The will of God is not for someone to prematurely die. I know I'm just going all the way in today. The will of God is not for someone to die of cancer before their purpose on the earth is fulfilled. The will of God was not for my child, my daughter, just this miracle, to die after 12 days of being born. It's not the will of God. But you know what God will do because he's good? He's merciful, he's kind, he's gracious, and he sees things from a view I don't understand and I can't make sense of. He says, Matt, that's not my will, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to work something together for your good. You know what your good is? Your development and maturity become more like Jesus. I can't explain it. It 
doesn't make sense in my mind. I still have moments I'm frustrated and even, if I can be honest, angry about it. But it doesn't change the truth. This is not God's will. John chapter 10, verse 10 says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus says, but I've come to give life and that more abundantly. Wherever you see stealing, killing, and destroying, it's not the work of God, it's the work of the devil. And you know what we should do is the same thing Jesus did. He said this in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, that Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit. He went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. This word oppression is this word to be under the tyranny of evil. Can I just say that our nation is oppressed? It's under the tyranny of evil. I'm not talking about a, a leader, president. Let's be honest. They're just submitted to whatever they submitted to. So anybody in position can submit to evil and all of a sudden evil falls on their life, flows through their life. When we understand though, that the mission of Jesus is summarized up in one verse. 1 John 3, 8 says, For this reason, the Son of God appeared to destroy the works of the devil. Can I say it in my version? Jesus showed up to kick the devil's butt and take names. And he's looking for a church that would do the same thing. He's not looking for a passive church. He's not looking for a complacent church. He's not even looking for a church that comes and gathers. He's looking for a church that would go out and kick the devil's butt. Go out and make, 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 dark, make, make darkness bow to the authority and the power of Jesus on your life, through your life. I think what's happened though is we've called ourselves spiritual by what we do in these four walls. Somebody help me preach. Well, oh, well, I came and we did 24 hours of worship. Keep doing 24 hours of worship, but when you're done with 24 hours of worship, what do you do with your life when you get out there? What are you doing when you go and you minister to the person at the library or you go and talk to the person at your school or you go to the person you talk with at your work? That's the reality. Unless we both declare and demonstrate the gospel, then it really isn't. Good news. 2023, as so I was in a season of just praying and seeking the Lord, Pastor Lynn and Heather blessed me by just saying, we want you to take all of 2023 off. And so I took 2023 and my time in the office, I would come in, spend time in the word and prayer and just seek the Lord on my office hours. And during one of those days in July of 2023, I went into a vision and this vision I saw, me, my wife, and our two ch children, Joy and Josiah, sitting on the couch, we were watching a movie, and as we were there, I saw the door to the front of our house open and someone walk in the house. This is in this vision. And I heard the Lord say, as I saw this, he said, what will you do? And I said, I would violently remove that person from my house. And the Lord said, sickness is in my house and it needs to be violently removed. You know that you're the temple of God. You're the house of God. You're the dwelling place where the spirit of God resides. And anything that's in your mind, in your body, or even in your spirit that is not God's kingdom is an intruder and it must be kicked out and cast out of your life and other people's lives. John Alexander Dowie said it this way. He is a man that was used in a healing movement here in the 50s. He said, sickness is an oppression of the devil and Jesus, the good shepherd has sent us to go and rescue the sheep from the ravenous wolf that's trying to devour them. And until we see sickness like a ravenous wolf trying to harm the sheep, we will not be moved to action to rescue them from this demonic attack. God anointed Jesus and he proclaims this. This is the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the vengeance of our God. It's not a word that we use too often, vengeance. But I love that it's the word that Jesus uses. Because when something is attacking you, it's an intrusion not only in your life, but it's an attack against Jesus. And he goes to move 
and goes to step in. He says this in Isaiah 35, verse four. He says, say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. This word vengeance actually means the word to revenge, avenge or to hold a grudge. You know that when something is attacking your life or has attacked your life, that God holds a grudge towards it? When a person holds a grudge, meaning this, now we're not supposed to hold grudges, but God can. And when God holds a grudge, what he's doing, he's up in heaven and goes, how am I going to make this pay? And how am I going to pay back? Or the scripture says, give recompense. How am I going to pay back this home, this family, this church, this community? This is what happens. Is we're just satisfied or we just settle or we're content with whatever the devil does. And we just try to move on. But God's up in heaven. He's like, I'm not gonna move on from this. I'm not gonna move on until this is dealt with. I'm not going to move on. Just think like this just didn't happen. What happens in culture, we just try to move on from things. And so we shove things down, our emotions. Oh, that doesn't really hurt that bad. I'll be fine. Just forget it, ignore it, push past through it. And what happens is you're harming yourself. And Jesus is up in heaven and he's saying, how can I deal with this? How can I make sure the enemy pays for everything they've taken from my children? I'll just tell you this right now. If I was out somewhere in public and someone came and communicated something to my daughter, Joy, She's a five-year-old. That was inappropriate. Should not be said. Got close to her, touched her. I don't think I wouldn't start throwing down. <laughs> How much more is our good father in heaven when he looks at one of his children who've been harmed and harassed and when I'm talking about his children, I'm not talking about just those who profess to be a child of God, but I'm talking about everyone who's been formed in the image and likeness of God that may not even know they're his child yet. That he's up in heaven, he's saying, you know what, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna plan this. I'm gonna plot this. And what we need to do is we need to recognize we are to be partners, our participants in that. See, Jesus didn't just declare and demonstrate the gospel, but so did the disciples. After the disciples had, after Jesus raised from the dead, after 40 days, he was beginning to teach the disciples for 40 days about the coming kingdom or about the kingdom of God. And they come and they ask him this question in Acts chapter six. And it seems like a really interesting question. It says, Lord, will you at this time restore your kingdom to Israel? And then he begins to talk about the times and seasons. And then in verse eight, he looks at his disciples. He says, but you shall receive power and the Holy Spirit was coming on you. What Jesus was saying is you want to know when the kingdom shows up is when my spirit comes upon you. My kingdom will come when my spirit is upon your life. He didn't answer the question when he was going to restore the kingdom. He just said this, when my spirit is upon you, my kingdom will be living in you. And all of a sudden now the disciples come out, Acts chapter two, the Holy Spirit pours out and begins to, John, the, uh, John and Peter begin to stand up and preach and 5,000 people get saved in that day. Acts chapter three, they go out, they raise up a man by his hand and says, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have, get up and walk. And all of a sudden, all through the book of Acts, we see both the acts of the disciples and the acts of the Holy Spirit because they are a partnership in one when the disciples understand that when the Spirit was poured upon me, His kingdom will move through me. See, reformation won't happen in our cities by getting on social media and proclaiming something. Sorry for all those social media influencers in the room. Use your voice. But the gospel of the kingdom must both be declared and demonstrated. 
It can't just be something we sit from afar in our house through social media, through our posts on Twitter, through our, our, even our words on social media. But you know what it requires? It requires you to get out of your natural element and step into an element where you're uncomfortable. It required Jesus to come out of heaven, the place of rest, and come into a place of chaos and say, I can turn this upside down. I want to know, do I got a church that's willing to go out of the four walls of the church and say, God, I don't have much, but I know your spirit upon me will be your kingdom moving through me. And when I go out there, I can change that because your spirit dwelling in my life. See, what God does in the secret place of your life must move into the public space of your life. It can't just stay what God has done internally in you. For the kingdom or the dominion of the king inside shall produce the dominion of the king on the outside. If God's really doing something on the inside of you, you know how it can't stay there. It just spills out. I found more and more in this, this last season of my life that uh, I am learning that certain things that God does in me, um, I have a hard time keeping it inside of me. Like I have a hard time like not telling other people about it. And I, I, know, I know that may sound strange, but sometimes I'm supposed to keep it inside because God says it's not ready to share that. But when you just got something in you, bubbling in you, something that's springing up, the Bible says out of us shall flow rivers of living water. When we have something in us, it can't stay here. It's meant to go out there. Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew chapter 10, he says, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you've received, freely give. He was saying, if I gave you something, it's your job to give it away. We see later on in Matthew chapter 16 as he's talking to the disciples and he's giving this open, uh, we could say this sort of sermon, illustrated, illustrated sermon. He takes them to this place called Caesarea Philippi, which is a place of open immorality, just the worst, more grotesque forms of, of perversion right out in the open. And then he says this, he says, who do people say that I am? And they begin to say, well, some people say this, some people say this. And all of a sudden, Peter gets this revelation from the Father. He says, you are the Christ of the Son of the living God. And Jesus looks back at Peter and says, you didn't get that from books, but you got that revelation from my Father. And let me tell you, Peter, who you are. You are a rock and I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. What he was saying is from this moment on, I'm going to give you authority. I'm going to give you power that literally all this open immorality, all this perversion, all this uncleanness, it doesn't have power to stop a church that knows who they are. Can I propose to you that as the world gets darker, it's a greater opportunity to be light. Can I propose to you, as you see more and more darkness, more and more crazy things of the world, it's not a time to be more and more intimidated or afraid or like, oh, wow, it's getting so evil up there. It's a time to find joy and excitement because this is an opportunity for the advancement of the kingdom of God to come. But it can't come based upon your knowledge can't come based upon your understanding. He says, flesh and blood, Peter didn't reveal this to you. Much of our life is connected to what we know, to what we understand and what is familiar to us. As I mentioned earlier in 2023, some of you know, but many of you may not be familiar. Her daughter, Justice Miracle, was born January 4th. 12 days later, she passed away. 2023 was the most difficult and challenging season of my life, of our family's life. And one of the things in going through that season, I came to a moment where I recognized I, I needed some, some help. And so I went to see a counselor and get some, some help and process some things. I went there and this is the thought I had in my mind. I thought, just I, sh I share what's going on and voila, everything's gonna be better. Like I'll just be back to my normal self and everything's good. And so I went there, shared for two and a half hours, come out of the meeting with this counselor. I got in my truck and this is a little what I said. I said, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done in my entire life. And hear me, it wasn't meeting with the counselor that was the dumbest thing ever in my entire life. It was, I thought I was just gonna be different by sharing for two and a half hours. 
So I get in my truck, I drive home. My family's asleep, it's later on in the evening. And I go into my prayer, prayer room. And I, I start sort of complaining to God and I'm sort of frustrated. And not this time, this is probably a early May time, maybe eight, late April. And uh, I was like, God, I, I just, I can't do this anymore. And I said, God, why didn't you? And I'm asking all these why questions to the Lord. And the Lord gives me this vision, this moment, this encounter with the Lord where I see this tree. And the Lord says, Matt, you're eating from the wrong tree. You're eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when you eat from knowledge of good and evil, you can't receive from the tree of life. You can't receive my life, my words. <sighs> my eyes are open. I feel a new, fresh revelation of God's goodness in that moment. I'm gonna give you real quick three hindrances to you seeing the kingdom of God in your life. The first one is doubt. Every miracle is on the other side of your doubt. Every miracle is on the other side of your doubt. Maybe it's time for you and me to start doubting our doubts. Like, I don't know, God, if you can do that. Well, maybe you just start doubting whatever you're doubting God in. You're like, well, that can't be true. God said it, it's got to be true. And so maybe I'm going to start doubting where I feel like a lack of faith or unbelief trying to rise up in my heart. See, doubt comes when you believe more in what you've seen or what the enemy is saying than what God has promised. Doubt exists in our hearts and our minds because we put more confidence in the flesh than we do in God's word. I know that that's real strong. You're like, that's hard to say, but we have to admit it. We have to admit we are a community of faith. We are believers. And yet, doubt consistently is trying to keep us from doing what God said we should do. Second hindrance to seeing the kingdom of God in our life is disappointment. Disappointment comes because you still fix your attention on what didn't happen instead of what God would like to do right now. I just want to say, I, I, I get it. I've been there. I've gone through loss. I've gone through hard, challenging, difficult, just, just sucks kind of stuff. I knew what the enemy would want to do is he would want to keep you stuck looking at what didn't and so disappointment keeps you fixed in a position. It causes you to have like your feet cemented in a position where you can't move forward. God, I want to believe you, but. And until we deal with our disappointments, until we say, God, I'm disappointed, I don't understand. And we resolve in our heart and our mind that we're going to give up the need to know and understand. We will never move into a place called faith. And the third thing is this, discouragement. Discouragement steals courage from you so you can't believe God for more and you simply settle for what you currently see. You know what we need? We need a fresh revelation of Jesus. All of the disciples up to this moment saw all these amazing miracles. Saw Jesus walk on water, saw the feet of the 5,000, saw, saw uh, 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 the, the dead race, saw all these incredible things and yet they come to this moment and they're still sort of like, I'm not quite sure what. I, th I think you're the Messiah. I thought you were and we're hoping and and all of a sudden, one revelation from the Father causes Peter from being a person who is consistently wrestling with doubt to a person who's like, I know you are the Messiah. 
You know what our world needs? You know what the church needs? You know what you need? Is we need a fresh revelation of Jesus. I'm not talking about something you got when you're 14 years old or something you had last week. I'm talking about manna, daily bread, fresh revelation. Something comes straight out of heaven. Say, I never saw that side of you. I never knew that part about you. We're singing and talking about God being holy. We're talking and singing about this revelation for encounter where the angels are in heaven and they're casting out their crowns and they're throwing them before the feet of Jesus and they're crying, holy, holy, holy. Why can they say that? Because all throughout eternity they're getting a fresh and a new revelation about God if the beings that are in heaven are sitting there and consistently getting a fresh revelation of Jesus how much more do you and I need a fresh revelation of Jesus if we're going to bring change to the world I want to have the band come up and join me see you can't get what God wants to do through your life through man Though teachers and preachers and men and women who carry the truth can help bring you a part of the revelation, it must be something you seek in your daily encounters. It must be something that you pursue after with all of your heart. It must be something you give your entire life to, pursuing God with all that's in you. If we're going to change the world, it won't come because you just are a better person. Or you just pray a little bit more or read your Bible and do your your daily devotional, your personal daily encounter just a little bit longer. You know what's gonna happen is when you get locked in face to face like Isaiah on the year that I saw, in the year of King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. You know what happened? Isaiah went from just being a minor prophet to a major prophet because he had a revelation of the Lord. You know what happened from just being a minor Christian, just a baby Christian, just an average Christian, just a person trying to get by and overcome sin, to becoming a major influencer that transforms and changes the world, is you get a revelation of the one who's seated far above all power and principality and title and rule in this age and the age to come. It doesn't come to you because you want it. It comes to you because you pursue it.